Good morning, all. I wanted to make this presentation available to you if you missed the API 2022 Storage Tank Conference in San Diego. The essence of the talk is the need to review and update API 653 Annex B for settlement because of the emergence of laser scanning data being used in settlement analysis today. This presentation is similar to the one that I will make to the API subcommittee on above ground storage tanks, nicknamed SCAST, with the hope that SCAST adopts these changes. Of course, it remains to be seen if they accept the changes. And just as a reminder, in spite of being an API SCAST member, I am not speaking on behalf of API or any other organization, and the opinions and ideas expressed herein are strictly my own. The focus of the talk is on differential settlement. Just a brief historical note on tank settlement. It appears that De Beer was the first to propose a tilt plane for settling tank bottoms in 1969. In 1974, Malik, Morton, Ruiz were researchers in the Department of Engineering Science at the University of Oxford, and they published a paper called Ovalization of Cylindrical Tanks as a Result of Foundation Settlement. They also introduced the tilt plane and the concept of out-of-plane differential settlement as well as shell ovalization caused by settlement. In 1982, the Journal of the Geotechnical Engineering Division of the American Society of Civil Engineers published a paper by Mar, Ramos, and Lambay. The Mar paper essentially consolidated the previous settlement work by past researchers and summarized the state of the art. It is the MAR paper work and formulas that were put into Annex B of API 653 in the early 1990s. However, shortly after the MAR paper was published, Duncan and Durazio published a paper that shows some serious problems with the MAR methods of tank bottom analysis. However, these concerns were never addressed by SCAST. In 2007, Andriani, who is an SCAST member, published a study on settlement that resulted in additional methods of analysis that were incorporated into API 653. To summarize, most of the tank settlement research was done in the 70s and 80s. The MAR paper became the basis for differential settlement criteria in API 653 soon after it was published. A major revision resulted from the 2007 work by Andriani. There are still some residual problems with what is in API 653 today, and we go into that now. Why am I focusing on differential settlement? The reason is that instead of a sparse data set that has typically been done for settlement, such as 8, 16, 32, or maybe 64 points traditional surveyors collect, with the advent of laser scans, we are now able to collect thousands to millions of points on the critical zone or the chime. Currently, many inspectors just pick out some small number of points and throw the rest of the data away. This is never as good as using all of the data provided that the data handling methods are done correctly. This shows a typical data set containing millions of points. We call such a data set dense as opposed to the traditional or sparse data sets. To get through this presentation quickly and efficiently, it's important to understand three fundamental concepts incorporated by Annex B of API 653. The first concept is that there may be a tilt plane. This means that while the tank settles, it is also tilting like a rigid body. Other settlement modes may be superimposed. But as stated earlier, our focus is on the settlement at the bottom of the shell, the so-called differential settlement. Second, the limits of differential settlement that all of the early researchers determined was done by analytic hand calculations because finite element analysis was not yet practical. So they relied on what I will explain more in a minute, which is the BEAM model. This is a crude model that Mar used to come up with the rules that are now in API 653. I do want to mention that Andriani did a parametric finite element study in 2007, which was also incorporated into API 653. Finally, the third concept is what we already talked about. Today, laser scan data is being used more frequently for settlement analysis. 
Therefore, API 653 needs updating to account for these new dense data sets. Let's jump back to concept one, which is the tilt plane. It either exists or is so small that it can be neglected. When there is a tilt plane, a cosine curve is formed as shown at the bottom. Unfortunately, API 653 incorrectly states that for the tilt plane to be valid, the R squared term, also called the coefficient of determination, must be at least 0 0.9. We don't have time to go into the statistics involved, but the correct way to determine if a rigid tilt plane exists is called the p-value. For a 95% or higher confidence that there exists a rigid tilt plane, the p-value is 100 minus the 95% level, so the p-value must be less than or equal to 5%. I will introduce this correction as part of the proposal to update API 653. To understand how crude and even error prone the MAR method is, consider the beam that supports the train tracks. These beams are over 10 feet high, but if you look at the inset, there is lateral stiffening because the beams this tall cannot resist local and global buckling. That is why there is this extensive set of stiffeners used. Marr assumed that the tank is a 48 foot high straight beam, just like the trestle bridge, but the height is about three times higher. Also, there is no stiffening. Instead, the beam is circular because the shell is circular, so it is stronger than a straight beam, but by how much was not even considered. While the roof and bottom does stiffen the shell, Marr made no attempt to model the actual details. Instead, he studied one terminal in Japan where the tanks did not fail. This means that Marr used a lower bound on differential settlement criteria, and it is unknown how conservative the Marr method is. It is not well calibrated. I think you get the idea. The MAR model is totally crude, but it is probably the best that could be done analytically in those days. Just a little more on the MAR model. The MAR criterion is based on curvature in the shell caused by differential settlement that drives the bending at the top of the tank beam. Now back to the idea of sparse and dense data sets. There are some pros and cons to each type of data set. One of the cons associated with laser data is the very large file sizes and the difficulty of manipulating and extracting the needed data. We have done this many times and found that there is another minor problem. Laser scan data near the bottom to shell junction is never equally spaced. This means that the numerical estimate of kappa or curvature used in the MAR model cannot be used as is. Instead, the unequal spacing must be mathematically accounted for. All of these details are covered in our white paper on the subject where a link is given on the last slide. Here is a typical settlement profile from a real tank where 16 equally spaced points were used. Note that even though R squared is only 0.26, the p-value is essentially zero. Therefore, there is a rigid tilt plane, and this is where API 653 currently goes astray. Here is the actual laser scan data we have used. Notice the jagged appearance. Much of this is noise, which is inherent to all data sets. However, there is a clear signal as well. The heavy black line is the differential settlement, showing how much it is above or below the tilt plane, represented by the dotted zero line. At this point, we know that there are two basic methods incorporated into the API 653 settlement analysis. The MAR method is based on curvature. The other method is the Andriani method. Joel Andriani is a committee colleague of mine, and he and his colleagues did extensive FEA studies back in the day to address settlement. The way that API 653 applies these two methods is based on the coefficient of determination, or R squared, for the data which if it is less than 0.9, then instructs the user to use the Andriani method. There's a problem with the R squared metric, which I'll go into a little bit later. So back to MAR, there are two very significant problems with it. It has bias whenever the elevation measurements are not 20 feet apart. When the spacing is small, such as for small tanks, the noise dominates. As mentioned previously, MAR was based on an outrageously crude model, 
Mars method was never validated either analytically or experimentally. The bottom panel illustrates the noise and bias problem. Note that Mars method can go wrong by a factor of two if the spacing is 32 feet. It is accurate at 8 feet after removing noise as shown. This comparison chart shows that Andriani validated their model using a 3% strain criterion based on single folds on the tank bottom of at least 20 feet length. Andriani's method does not depend on kappa, the curvature as we saw before. It does not have the bias and noise problem that Marr has. However, with other types of differential settlements such as many folds or twists, it is unknown how good the Andriani's method might be. There's another problem, which is the alternate graphical method where the inset shows API 653 instructions for this. The method is an error because it assumed that only settlement with R squared greater than 0.9 is valid. In this method, they did not subtract the tilt plane. It's also not repeatable, so this method is recommended not to be used. As a recap, the real data plotted on the left shows that a single mode cosine fit is not a very good one, as indicated by the red line. A two mode cosine fit is much better, and it even brings the R squared up to 0 0.99. The red plot on the right is a cosine fit described by API 653 from the actual data, which you can see as the light gray line. However, the blue line indicates a two-mode fit, and you can see that it is much better. This is important because low curvature folds like these do not cause high stresses in the curvature models described earlier. The Marr and Andriani method papers only illustrate how to do the analysis with sparse, equally spaced measurements. For thousands of points, what to do? Fortunately, there is a mathematical theorem that says that the exact curvature of the tank bottom parameter can be modeled by a Fourier series. In developing the coding to do this, we'll call it trig regression. To see why, look at the figure. Here we have an arbitrary curve. In this case, it is the so-called sawtooth wave. If you only use a single sinusoid to model the sawtooth, it would be the red line. Pretty crude. But if you add higher frequencies by using sines and cosines, you can get a much better fit. In the case of the figure, the blue line represents fitting 20 modes of a cosine curve by regression to arrive at the approximate fit. It's not too bad, right? Here is a real tank where we demonstrate the use of trig regression on real laser scan data. The solid black line is a trig regression fitting elevation data and the out-of-plane differential settlement. The curvature kappa is found by estimating the numerical second derivative for each triplet of points. When smooth, we get the solid red curvature line kappa. When the curvature is sufficiently high and passes the dotted bounding lines above or below the rigid tilt plane, then the tank fails the criteria. This slide summarizes the differences we have already discussed. Mars method has too many problems to be practical and it should be replaced by the Andriani method. Andriani, however, is limited to single folds of at least 20 foot arc length. It is better calibrated than Mar. Trig fit can deal with dense data sets and is the most general in that there is no limit to the number of modes it can deal with, but it should only be used on dense data sets. So with this background, we are ready to see how to fix differential settlement in API 653. This slide shows the current rules as of the fifth edition of API 653. Note the R squared criteria. If R squared is valid, then the MAR method is used. And if that fails, you can use the Andriani method. If the tilt plane is not considered valid, then the user is directed to the incorrect alternative graphical method. As you can see, there is much that is suboptimal with the current differential settlement protocol in the API. The only item that should be preserved is the Andriani method given in B.3.2.2. As mentioned, we want to be able to deal with sparse or dense data sets. Here is a proposed protocol that will fix all of these problems. Note that R squared is not involved and you can go directly to the Andriani analysis. 
If it does not pass, then you could use the gold standard, which is FEA, or you could just repair the tank. Note that while you could go directly to the gold standard, this is not done as frequently as the inspection companies typically have to contract someone else to do the FEA, and the time involved to produce the report would be longer. But the light brown dotted line shows that you have a choice. The protocol for dense data is basically identical, except that the method of analysis is to use the trig regression methodology. Our white paper shows how to do this, and if the committee agrees, then we will show how to do this with an example. To summarize the proposal, we first want to correct fundamental errors with what is in API 653, which are the incorrect use of the R-squared and the use of the Andriani graphical method. Second, we believe that MAR has too many problems caused by bias and noise, and that the Andriani method is just as simple but better and should be applied as a basic approach to the analysis. Finally, if there is dense data, we would like to be able to use the data efficiently to establish if the curvature at the bottom of the tank perimeter is acceptable. Finally, we want to be clear that the gold standard, which is FEA, can always be used if the owner so chooses. This slide is a more formal summary of the different modeling methods used that we have already talked about, and it is included for reference. I don't expect you to be convinced of everything I have talked about, but if you are willing to roll up your sleeves, all of the details are included in the link to a chapter on settlement that has all of the essential details. Thank you.